Hey, everybody. So happy to have you. My name is Lori LaRusso, and today is a very special day. It is Java's 25th birthday. So in honor of that, I am wearing my shirt I got last year at Jay Onsen. And my background reflects the airport uh, right outside of Osaka, which is where I first landed on my first Java developer tour. So I'm super excited to kick this off with you guys today. So let me just uh, share my screen as they say. Cool. So here we are. This is our virtual Java user group. And I'm so excited that today when I hit start, it worked. I hope. Um, <laughs> so let's get into this. Who am I? I am Lori LaRusso. I, ooh, I work for JFrog. And our uh, event today is brought to you by SNCC. They are the ones that have hooked us up with Zoom and make this all this connection possible. If you have questions, please do us a favor and go to our Slack channel and click on the live session channel. That is where we will be answering everything. You can also give us feedback at Virtual Jug. I'll be looking at that uh, while we are in session. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Uberto Barbini. This is our take two. He was so kind to be able to reschedule with us. I met Uberto uh, in 2018 at Jay Onsen, my first ever unconference, and it was in Japan and it was an amazing experience. So with that, let me hand it over. Hi, hi everybody. Hi, really. Um, I'm so happy to be here, to be honest. Um, uh, Lohi invited me to talk with um, Virtual Jug, and that's first time for me. And we are living a uh, challenging time, but uh, I hope we are making uh, good out of it. So um, I'm uh, Uberto, as uh, Lohi already introduced me. And we are going to talk about uh, functional microservice today. This is uh, the map of uh, what uh, we are going to talk now. And what I want to say is just that uh, this talk is basically on um, about a project where I'm working on. So it's not something, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical. It's something that we do day by day for several years now. And so let's see how using this functional approach in microservice help uh, in uh, several ways. And I hope uh, you can find some uh, useful hints for your project as well. So let's start first uh, with uh, a, a quote from Simon Brown. I don't know how many of you know him, but uh, he's a very good uh, architect. And uh, if you want to, to learn something about the software architecture, you should definitely have a look at uh, his books and uh, his material. And Simon Brown, anyway, um, could have this uh, kind of famous tweet about, uh, if you can't build a monolith correctly, why do you think putting a network in the middle will help? Which I think is fair enough. But on the other side, uh, after some experience, I have uh, this kind of feeling that uh, you know, you can say, if you can't run a marathon, why well, you think you can run a 5K 10 times? And uh, yeah, putting the net in the middle, make a monolith, I mean, make my microservice a bit more complicated to deploy the monolith, but it also simplify many things because you are splitting something bigger in uh, many smaller things. And then we will see how this uh, will actually work, at least how it's working for us, and I hope uh, for you as well. But first, uh, let's have a bit of um, ask, what is a functional paradigm? Because uh, there is a lot of people talking about functional programming now, but functional programming is not about, uh, it's not only monads or flat mapping uh, or things with a strange name. 
but this is something very simple as a basic concept. We are going to use a function. So we have a function that goes from A to B, where A and B are types. Another function that goes from B to C. And if we are in the functional paradigm, we can compose these two function in a new function that goes from A to C. This seems quite uh, simple and even uh, quite uh, not that interesting, but it's actually quite deep uh, consequences. So I really think uh, that if you really understand this, uh, you really understand everything that uh, is needed is important for functional programming. One consequence is that we needed to define our type very well. So ABC must be specific type because uh, using um, function uh, using strings or prim primitives is not really um, basically it will uh, limit our expression in a functional paradigm. The second point is that uh, if we are going to compose the function, that means that we needed to have a way to safely compose functions. So function became uh, types and we are using function as they were just the data. And the first thing is that uh, if we wanted to compose A, B and then B and C, that means that A, B and C must be immutable because otherwise we cannot really compose uh, if uh, the object uh, can change uh, behind. We needed to make sure that uh, whatever is representing A will stay the same along the whole process. And the final point is that we cannot use really exception. This is something that in function programming scrolling totality. And that means that uh, each function should uh, completely take care. So transforming each A in one B, it cannot uh, jump out uh, from the diagram. Otherwise we cannot really um, compose in a safe way. Um, this is not exactly a talk on functional programming. I have another talk on functional programming if you want to look at uh, uh, YouTube, but this is kind of a necessary for what we are going to talk now. And this is, uh, this is more or less how a full uh, uh, functional uh, microservice will look like. A transformation from uh, a request uh, to a lot of uh, intermediate type until we, we got uh, back uh, a response. And this was inspired uh, by this idea of using a web server as a function that is a famous uh, paper written by one of the architects at Twitter. And uh, the basic idea is that uh, each web server is just a function that transforms a request to a response. And if you treat this as uh, your basic paradigm, it's quite easy to see that uh, your microservice are just a collection of functions in your domain. And uh, we are using Kotlin as a language because it's a very nice um, citizen in the Java JVM. And it's also very friendly to functional programming without being a, extremely hard to understand. I think it's quite uh, simple for a Java programmer to start using Kotlin immediately. But on the main uh, change that uh, Kotlin, the main benefit that Kotlin brings to the Java is that uh, is a new type system, which is more powerful than uh, the Java type system. So we can express better what is the concept of a nullability and how to compose function because function are actually types. But this in, um, in the Kotlin world that we have this uh, framework that is called uh, HTTP4K, which is a kind of implementation of the paper we saw before. So in HTTP4K, everything is uh, just a transformation between a request and response. And we build all our microservice application, our uh, microservice system around uh, this concept. But before going a, a bit into detail, uh, I would like to explain how we 
design our system. And uh, here we use another, um, oh, how, how I say, another practice, which is called uh, event storming. And uh, the idea of uh, event storming as a design technique is uh, try to describe uh, your system, either your current one or the one that you are going to create, as a, a series of uh, events. Event meaning uh, here, business event. Uh, so in, uh, in our system, uh, this is uh, an academic journal uh, company. So we have something like uh, auto submit an article, uh, the article get uh, accepted for publication or get rejected for publication. The article get uh, type proofed and uh, all the steps uh, that happen uh, in the journal uh, life cycle. We try to identify each one as an event. And the nice things about event storming is that uh, we basically use a different uh, colors for uh, post-it. So each event, uh, we write an event in the post-it uh, using different colors for this kind of different event. If you go to the website, I will finish explain, but just to give an idea. And then we take all the space that we want. In our case, we just use a, a a big windows. And then uh, we start up basically in a parallel, everybody start putting this um, uh, post-it on the windows. And then one, uh, everybody, so everybody was invited. So BA, stakeholders, uh, developers, QA, project management. When everybody was kind of uh, happy that all the events were, that was going to happen will be kind of map. We try to put them together. And this is uh, basically the, uh, this picture. We identify some big boundaries, this, um, uh, I don't know, Fuchsia lines, and then uh, some small subdomain, something that uh, also we can call a boundary context which is different life cycle of the events. And also we have a, a bunch of uh, events that are not associated to anything because it's something that we, we support manually, not in our application. So we kind of uh, express. So from uh, basically these windows, we figure out all the events that uh, we need uh, to create our system. And uh, very, very roughly speaking, each of these, uh, circles became a, a microservice. Not exactly one-to-one, -one, but it's a first uh, approximation. And from this uh, um, kind of windows, uh, taking a bit of picture, working a bit more, we, we, we got uh, basically our, um, our final diagram, which is uh, this one. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, all of the Microsoft that uh, we needed, we found that uh, roughly fall in one of three uh, type. So we have a complex uh, microservice that really manage a state that change with a complex business rule. That is something that we call state machine, which is more or less what in the uh, domain driven design they call aggregate, roughly. Then we have something a simple, very, very immutable state a microservice, which is something like a cache or some configuration. And then we have some microservices which are completely stateless. So it's just a service that give an answer from a specific question, request, and the the same request will always get the same answer. There is no internal state. So this is how we use this concept. Uh, we design our um, microservice. And the one uh, here in this diagram, uh, the one with the yellow, are uh, the one with the state machine. Uh, the one with the blue are uh, the one with the just uh, immutable state. And the one transparent are uh, the uh, 
completely stateless ones. So for example, the, the UI is completely stateless. We don't have any state in the UI, but the UI will call other service to get the specific state uh, of the auto. And uh, let's, uh, let's work a bit uh, now, a bit more detail. But um, first, uh, let me also specify one thing. In this diagram, everything, uh, as I said, uh, work like a function. So each uh, microservice is talking with the other microservice on the idea that there is a request and I get a response. So everything is, is about, about transformation. And we try to make sure that uh, we, there is nothing that uh, is kind of a side effect. So all the uh, information must be present in the request and uh, everything that is uh, relevant will be um, replying the response. Or if we cannot have a, a synchronous response, we have a, we will have a, a, an asynchronous response. So we first we put the data and then we call uh, when the response will be ready. But we are very keen to try to define what is the input and what are the output. And uh, let's try to see a bit more in detail how we write the code of this service. So the most simple one are the one with the pure function. So there is just a, a request that return a response. And this is more or less like the code looks like in Kotlin with the HTTP4K. Just to clarify, this is exactly the same than this. It's just a, a different way to represent. And we like this uh, second way much more than uh, having nested uh, uh, kind of a Christmas tree uh, structure. How we hit that this uh, is a kind of an example that um, I'm, I'm working on. So to fetch a list, uh, we needed to start with the request, extract this data, pass this to another function that fetch the list content render the result in HTML and then create a response with the HTML inside. So our, our whole uh, microservice is uh, just uh, four function that are appended one to each other. And working in this way, it's actually helping us a lot to keep uh, this um, complexity out of our microservice and each microservice really need only to know as little as possible of the rest of the system. Then for slightly more complicated uh, microservice where we also need a state, we have something uh, like this. Okay, these are the possible routes on uh, something similar. So this is where the path will uh, be in the a get and they will uh, attached to the uh, generate function. And this is how, this is just uh, an example for something that does uh, generate a shorter URL. And this will uh, attach it to expand. And this is just uh, the function of expand. And you can see that in this case is slightly more complicated because we have a, a, a database in the middle which make a bit more um, complicated and uh, it's not fully functional because this is a, a side effect call. It's not a perfect call, but in a sense, uh, it's also um, in the life cycle of the request, this actually is uh, immutable. We, we don't change uh, the persistence inside the same request that we look at the persistence. And so it's quite uh, functional in a kind of a practical way. And also just to make uh, clear, uh, in this case, uh, we just use a uh, null for uh, error. So any kind of errors, we just return a null 
and that will uh, result in the not found response. We, we have a more complicated code, uh, of course, but uh, even in our production service, most of the code is still expressed uh, in something like that. In uh, Roots with a touch with some uh, function, and each function is a um, cascade of calls. And then uh, they have the third uh, kind of state, okay, the third kind of uh, microservice, which uh, what we call the state machines. And we implement it with the uh, event sourcing and the uh, CQRS, where CQRS stands for Common Query responsibility segregation, which is a very long word and a complicated sounding. But the, the gist is quite simple. is uh, just uh, the idea to separate the read model from the write model. So when we write something, we just uh, record what's happening. When we read something, we, we create uh, some uh, view of the data that are uh, as uh, the most useful view that we need uh, for doing our transformation. And uh, the next part is that uh, this event sourcing uh, works very, very well with um, functional uh, statement because it's based on this idea that instead of uh, saving the state in the database, we save uh, the changes of what's changed, sorry, we save what have been changed in um, each uh, command in the, our database. So it's kind of, we just save uh, the diff uh, like a Git works basically. It's just uh, our database became a log of a uh, diff. And from this diff, we can uh, recreate uh, the state. And this helps us because uh, it's slightly more difficult to write the code in this way but uh, it's also quite uh, useful to try to do this because uh, that means that we found a lot of problems directly in the modeling uh, uh, discussion before we solve a lot of uh, technical problem directly when we try to model the domain before start writing the code. And uh, if we go back a second to the, to the windows, Basically, the, the complicated part is what uh, became a, a, a state machine. And all these events needed to be thought out and then translated in code and uh, try to understand exactly what's happening for each possible event. And the which event are kind of a consistent with which state. So we have a, if an auto, auto get uh, rejected, we cannot. Uh, process uh, his application. He needed to go outside the system quickly. And uh, in this way, we um, simplify the possible uh, state that, that we need uh, to think about. And this idea of uh, immutable events really work very well with the functional paradigm. So everything, uh, it just uh, work uh, as a state machine and for each, uh, Mm. For each data that came in, we can figure out uh, is exact history if we want. So we can look at why exactly in the, is in the current state and all this state transformation that happened. And uh, another concept uh, which is uh, quite useful is uh, this concept of uh, the hexagonal architecture that you may have heard because it's uh, quite also useful in the object orientation programming. But uh, when we apply this uh, to this um, functional paradigm, we came out with this concept of a hub. So a hub is everything that is in the domain and the hub is uh, connected with uh, all the external dependency using the functions. So we have a lot of functions with uh, hub and inside the hub everything is completely functional, completely uh, pure. In this way, we can uh, clearly distinguish what is a technical implementation, technical detail, uh, 
like uh, yeah for example the monitoring uh, the HTTP layers uh, the database access from uh, what is uh, the domain state uh, composition and this is a bit of a kind of a example code with a kind of a to-do list. And you can see that uh, we have our hosts and uh, our hosts are connected to a hub. So this is our hub. And uh, now in this case, uh, everything that is a domain is a something that happens inside the hub. So in this case, it's transforming a, a user to a, a, in this case, a user plus a list name will return a specific list. And then everything that is not uh, part of the domain will stay here as a, uh, you can see here, uh, technical transformation. So this will help us because we can clearly distinguish what is a domain from what is not a domain. And uh, if we wanted to have a different implementation, we, we only needed to I mean, a different protocol, we only needed to change uh, the adapter part. If we wanted to touch the domain, uh, we only needed to look inside the hub. There should be no domain logic inside the hub. And uh, this is another nice part of uh, event sourcing because uh, the event sourcing basically uh, simplify a lot of the matching uh, with the database. Normal uh, using object oriented is always uh, challenging uh, to match what is uh, our object looks like and our database looks like. It's very hard to make uh, work very well. There are always something that is not really fitting, but uh, we don't have this problem with the event sourcing because we can uh, match exactly what's changing. Our objects are immutable. And uh, what is going to mute is uh, the event. So we can have a perfect matching. And this also thinking about uh, this uh, transformation improve our domain design. And uh, also we don't lose any information because uh, for example, if something get uh, rejected and then get approved again, we can still uh, return, uh, I mean, retrieve uh, the information why it was rejected in the past. If some price changes, we can look at the older history of the price. So we have more information than a normal system. And then when we need some special report, we can just create our own projection. So running the events and then creating the view of the data, a bit like SQL views that exactly represent our reports. And let's just look a bit of uh, our code, how we represent uh, these uh, state machines. And uh, here you can see uh, the possible state of the state machine. So he, this is uh, just an example with the to-do list. So the to-do list can be from initial state you can create a list and then you return an active list. From an active list you can put on hold or also you can put on close. From a, a list that is put uh, on hold, we can release it. That means that it returns active again. But in this way, we can uh, be sure that uh, there are no, um, um, no missing parts because everything, everything must be uh, connected together. And uh, uh, it's also clear that you cannot release a list if it's already active. You can only release a list if it's blocked. And then we can also look at the events. So to change each of the state, these are the events that are changing for each state. So it's, uh, if you want, it's a bit boring to have uh, this long list of uh, events and the state rather than a normal database where basically probably, I don't know, the state will be just uh, in AMA and then uh, 
you don't need to care about the events. So it's a bit more uh, code to write, that's for sure, but it's also much safer. And uh, we also stimulate uh, interest in discussion uh, immediately. I mean, before going uh, in the technical detail of the implementation. And um, then there is another bigger question, which is uh, push or pull, what uh, to do? Oops, sorry, I just realized that I need. Uh, just a second. Sorry <laughs> about we are, we are back again. <laughs> and um, so push or pull, yes. The problem with the microservice is that uh, we needed to decide uh, do we want it to pull data or we wanted to push data when something changed. And uh, push is kind of simple because we just say, okay, this is done. Now we push it to another service. The problem is that what's happening if the other service is down? We cannot just fail uh, the request. So we needed to kind of remember that that was down. So as soon as it go up again, we needed to push. And um, so it's kind of easier to implement, uh, but it's also a bit more, uh, if you wanted to do it well, uh, uh, it's kind of more fragile. So if you want to make it safer, then it became more complicated. And uh, if we do a pull instead, we only pull the data when we need. If, if uh, the other system is down, it's not a big issue because uh, we just don't pull the data. And um, we, to implement a, uh, a push uh, in the correct way, we should uh, use some kind of persistent queues. To do a pull, uh, we just need the HTTP. And that's basically the reason why we choose to do pull. And uh, doing a bit more work on our side, but using uh, HTTP REST for everything. So each service will only pull uh, from the other service. This is something, I mean, is uh, really, I think uh, it's, um, team I should find uh, it's on a right specification on uh, its uh, project. Also, the pull, uh, for example, imply that there is always a bit of uh, delay. But for us, it's not a big problem because even uh, if an auto accept um, uh, a manuscript, uh, we can say, yes, yeah, been accepted. Uh, like one minute later is perfectly fine. If you need a real, syst real time systems, you need that definitely to go for a push uh, system with some kind of persistent queues. And now another thing that is particularly, um, in uh, something that I care particularly is about the testing. On top of the normal unit testing, we also try to test uh, the world uh, system end to end. But uh, we have this idea, which is a not price idea actually, to test uh, the domain separately from the external layer, so end to end, but using the same test. So we write the test, and uh, let's say that these three are our three microservices that uh, interact with each other and uh, each other has uh, its own hub and uh, its own uh, hexagonal architecture. We have uh, one test, uh, then uh, it's doing uh, the HTML calls. So it's uh, using each uh, microservice uh, from, uh, from the external using the normal HTTP endpoint. 
and then we run the same test with a different uh, interpreter we call that it's only run uh, domain only, so hub to hub. And it's kind of simulating uh, what's happening if we put the three hub together in a single uh, monolith. And uh, it put everything together and then test uh, the application as it was a single monolith. And since we are running exactly the same test, uh, that gives us a kind of assurance that uh, it's working end to end, but also all the logic is inside the, the domain and uh, we don't need uh, the external layers in uh, to validate our logic. And I create a, um, a, a framework basically on our experience, try to also to, to beautify a bit of the code, our production code and make it a bit uh, generic and nice. And this is more like, like uh, how our DDT will looks like. You can find the code on GitHub. And uh, it's a just a version one, but it's quite solid uh, because uh, it's the code that we use in production for more than one year. So um, many years actually. Um, and see, this is how it works basically. It's a uh, a bit like a Cucumber if you want, but this is uh, DSL, this is actual code, there is no regex. And uh, you put some settings and then uh, you kind of play as it was a scenario at Ryza, uh, you, your actors um, actually call uh, the system. You can find the world code there. But this is just to say that basically we use the actors to represent the actual user of our system. I mean, real person, but we also make sure that the uh, assertion of the test stay outside the test. Because uh, if we put all the technical assertion inside uh, the test, the test became very hard to read. So all the assertions like uh, Mary put uh, a lamb into the car it always will check that uh, we can call the system uh, and uh, the system will return the correct uh, answer. And then uh, we can check uh, if we have an exception, we, we, we create a step uh, basically that uh, there are no more Lambert for sale, for example. And then here we, we can say that uh, we want to run this test on all our interpreters. That means that when we run the test, we have something like this, where they have the name of the test and then uh, this is a domain only and this is a HTTP with uh, the actual host calling uh, the same things. And of course it can fail or everything can be nice. And also this is another thing that uh, using microservice make uh, very nice for us to, to kind of verify this uh, scenario very quickly because we don't have to have a big monolith uh, or deployment, we can just uh, verify the small bits that we need. Okay, another topic, uh, which is uh, the monitoring. Also here, we, we took this uh, kind of functional approach. First, we treat the logs as a business requirement. So whatever goes in uh, Microsoft in uh, monitoring, we are using the standard uh, Elasticsearch uh, log stash and Kibana for monitoring our microservice. But uh, we really treat our logs as business requirement. So we wanted to specify exactly what should the system log before starting writing the system, or at least when we are writing the system. And instead of uh, just uh, logging strings, like in uh, log4j, we, we keep a uh, structured data so we can keep a uh, the request, uh, what is exactly the response, uh, what are the permissions. And the general principle is uh, always to log as little as possible when things go well and as much as possible when th there are errors. So every time there is an error, we try to put uh, the whole uh, context of the error inside the log so we can uh, reconstruct. Uh, but we don't log much uh, when uh, things go well. We just uh, Record that uh, some transaction happened. 
and this actually also work very well with the functional programming because uh, the monitoring, uh, yeah, this is uh, the kind of interface that we have uh, for monitoring is very small interface. And every time we need the monitoring, like uh, when we create a, a hub, we put uh, the monitor as a dependency, basically. So we don't use uh, the standard Java log4j uh, login tool. Everything uh, goes uh, using this monitoring and everything must be uh, part of the request and the, the response. Basically. And finally, what do we do with our matrix? And um, there is a, this book that is a very interesting and important book. I think it was a uh, yeah, couple of years ago that basically uh, the assumption of this book is quite interesting because uh, we know that the team wanted to measure how much time do we know do we take to do a feature but it's very hard uh, not to say impossible to measure how, how much time we take uh, to do a feature because first we needed to estimate the feature and then we don't know if the estimate is consistent is correct then we can take the time that it took to develop develop the feature that's quite enough but then we don't know how to compare with other time and to deliver other feature. So this uh, guys basically took a different approach, a more scientific approach. And uh, instead of uh, measuring the time that it takes to develop a feature, they just measure four things. The de deployment frequency. So um, how many times you deploy stuff in production. And so stuff in production means that you, you, you have a real user feedback on what you are doing. How, many, how long a time does it take uh, from something that has been uh, committed, so the finished deployment to be uh, ready to go in production? So if you have a continuous uh, integration, uh, it could take uh, less than one hour. If you need a... Uh, um, like uh, spring uh, sprints, it will take some weeks. If you have a very standard, uh, I mean, very traditional project management, it can take uh, several months. Then uh, it takes also the, so how, mu how much frequently do you deploy in production? How much take to redeploy in production? How long this uh, is uh, the measure, the, uh, the time between uh, a problem and uh, the fix. So can you fix something in less than one hour, in less than one day, or, or you need more time? And then uh, the change failure rate, which is how, how often you need uh, to hold back your release uh, to, to go back. And having uh, everything in uh, microservice will also help to hear us because we can uh, do continuous deployment. So we are, Definitely in this high performance column, we, de we deploy several times per day. It took uh, like half an hour for us to reach the production. We usually fix a problem in uh, maybe a couple of hours or definitely less than three hours. And our change failure is very, very little. We almost never needed to hold back because we are so used to fix stuff on the fly and uh, just uh, deploy this uh, microservice that has been changed between uh, between commits, basically. And also using this test that I showed before, we are kind of confident uh, when we deploy something that, that something will be working well. So uh, did, did, uh, having done this um, investment in the infrastructure, the result is that we can really perform very quickly. And this gives us also more time to develop a new feature at the end of the day. So the kind of final question is that, uh, could I have done all this in a monolith? Well, I don't think maybe, 
I think the, my answer will be maybe, but that would be probably more complicated than using microservice. Having this kind of a big monolith uh, is definitely something that is possible, but it will be very painful, very hard to change it, to deploy, to keep a new requirement. Instead of microservice, we spend very quickly, had the new service, uh, keep it in a stand, state of um, um, provisional state. And uh, when it's done, uh, just switch the old service to the new service and uh, even very quick. And uh, we can keep at the same um, system in production doing even very big changes to the process. Yeah, it's something, again, you can do the same with the monolith, but will be be easier? I mean, my experience say probably not. And uh, just something that we are looking for the future, well, uh, near future, something that is called Quarkus, and that is very interesting uh, framework that allow us uh, to, um, what, what Quarkus introduces is a development mode where basically you change your Java code and it goes directly in um, auto replacing the current code. So every time you do a request to our, to the job uh, to the HTTP server, you get a new code and you don't need to manually compile and deploy even locally. And our idea is that uh, since we have all this microservice, we don't need all, the, all this microservice uh, for developing time. So on a local uh, developer machine, we, we can start all this microservice as a local uh, instance using different ports, but we can also probably keep all the microservice in a single uh, executable and uh, just having the HTTP handler talk with the, each other and just exposing to the user the UI, put everything inside the Quarkus. So having a, a kind of a, you know, a kind of a mini Kubernetes running on Quarkus uh, with all our microservice system. And this is something that we are trying to explore now that will be very cool because that means that we can change the code without stopping the application. But uh, yes, this is a, uh, this is the future. This is a bit of a new ideas. And um, yeah, let me know your question. You can also reach me on um, Twitter, uh, GitHub, uh, blog, uh, and also I'm writing the books about uh, this concept. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, you can kind of uh, put um, your name here and uh, you will be notified when uh, there is uh, some announcement about the books. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, Laurie. I, do we have any questions? Cool, so right now we do not have any questions, but um, while we wait for them to come in, since it is the 25th anniversary of Java, why don't you tell us uh, how long you've been working in Java and how you got started? Just as a little fun. Uh, yeah. I I think I started working in Java in the 2000 and Java was already five years old. And uh, I al always felt that I'm kind of beginners of Java because uh, I missed uh, those five years uh, of uh, Java <laughs> formation. Uh, but yeah, I mean, since then, uh, a lot of things uh, change in the Java, um, Java environment is really exciting how Java is keeping renovating itself. And um, it's becoming uh, even probably more nimble now than it was in the past. And so it's really, really nice still to work on uh, this, uh, the JVM uh, world. Cool. So we do have some questions coming in. So the first question is regarding the push versus pull. Did you say that if you need a near real-time system, you should use the pull approach? Uh, yes, I mean, that really depends how, what do you mean for real-time? Because if you seriously mean real-time, you can probably need it to rule out a microservice at all. If you need it to, to give a response in uh, 
one or two milliseconds, you cannot really have a, an architecture with a microservice. But uh, if you need a, I don't know, give an answer in a 20, 30 milliseconds, you can use a microservice, but you definitely need uh, to use uh, the push. You need to, to give it the answer immediately. And uh, if one microservice is down, uh, that means that you cannot, uh, you, all your microservices have to run at the same time, basically. This is constraint. Okay. Second question, uh, where are you storing the events? Postgres or using get event store, et cetera? Uh, we are using uh, uh, Postgres. Um, nothing wrong with the event store. Um, Postgres is good enough for us. And also because Postgres has a, this incredibly nice way to use a JSON for queries and storing data like it was a NoSQL database, but with the SQL on top and the transaction on top. It will also allow us to do the concurrency in a kind of um, smarter way. And I will also probably write about this kind of details in the book. Excellent. Um, so Tom has got kind of a multi-part question and um, Let's start. It says, could you please talk a bit about how you build the microservices, how your repos are set up, mono repo versus multiple repos, and how you manage shared code components? Now, that's a lot to unpack. So um, I don't know if you can get to it all uh, right now, or if maybe you want to hit them back up in the Slack channel. Uh, but you just let me know what you want to answer. Yeah, well, uh, we are using uh, mono repo, meaning that uh, each team has uh, its own uh, repo. So it's uh, kind of mo not mono repo for company, but mono repo for team. That means that we have uh, like a 30 uh, microservices in our team and uh, they are all in the same mono repo, but we uh, deploy them uh, independently. So the pipeline uh, is uh, just looking at, at each single uh, microservice. So we, we don't have to, we, we usually never deploy all microservices in one go. Each commit will only deploy the microservices that are impact, impacted. Yeah, cool. this is the short version for the long version. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Pedro has a question. Is there a framework in Java for functional microservices? Uh, I think there is something uh, like uh, HP4K in Java, like HP4J, I don't know, something like that. Um, no, nothing, uh, there's nothing specific about Kotlin. So even HP4K should work with Java, but uh, could be a bit awkward of uh, syntax. Um, I don't know. It's also not very hard to create a one yourself on top of uh, some, uh, lightweight. I mean, even HTTP4K is not a real web server. It's just a wrapper around the Jetty or okay HTTP. So you can just do more or less the same if you want. Okay. And you know that everybody knows that I'm not a developer. So here's the next question. Um, just in case you're repeating yourself and I apologize for that. Can the same function which you demonstrated be done in Java code and how complex would it be? Uh, okay, the answer is yes, it can be done. It's not particularly complex uh, to do in um, in Java. It's just that the syntax is a bit uh, more ugly to look at, basically. So uh, for us, Kotlin is more um, a productivity point that, I mean, using Kotlin, we can be more productive because it's, the code is easier to read. And it's kind of more safer because it's um, the type system, for example, nullability is easier to check on nullability in Kotlin instead in Java is completely left to the um, developer. But you can definitely, um, everything else, I mean, you can just re-implement uh, in Java. And uh, instead of having this, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, instead of having this chain of letter in Java that this will be an apply, 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 and you can uh, 
uh, yeah, compose a function on the apply as well. And by the way, uh, well, sorry. This uh, pesticide, our my framework also works in Java. There is also a Java example. Cool. So I've got a question from Nicholas, and it's a non-technical question, and he wants to know um, how many team members are there, and what are their backgrounds? Like, did you have to convert them to FP, or did they already have such a background? Um. We, in this moment, we are like five developers. At some point, we were like uh, 12 plus uh, BA, QA, and everything. Uh, we did, uh, for some junior guy, we did a kind of internal workshop to kind of help them to get up to speed with the functional. We're not doing uh, any kind of crazy functional programming. Uh, monad stuff, uh, lens or whatever. Uh, we are kind of um, just a simple uh, function composition. And mm, it just that, uh, I mean, most of the developer were already keen to use this kind of style. So there was no really need of specific conversion. But we, yeah, we, we have to basically to let the more junior guy to to get on board on this style. But they did quite well, actually, after a couple of months, yeah. Awesome. So Wasim wants to know, typically, how many services are you calling to fulfill a single user request? Uh, sorry, on a single? Uh, yeah, how many services are you calling to uh, fulfill a single user request? So um, typically, we try not too many, but uh, especially, usually, it's only one of these uh, heavy service that we call a state machine, because those are the one that uh, directly handle the user request. So um, typically, a user request is a request to change something or to look at something, but look is not that the problem. It's when uh, the user wanted to interact the system, so they change the state of the system. And this is usually only one of the bigger uh, state machine microservice, which can also call uh, other smaller, lighter microservice. So it can be three or four, something like that. It can be only one. Uh, but apart that uh, UI is a different, so there will be always the one UI plus uh, one or two backend. Excellent. So uh, we don't have any more questions in the queue. So I'm going to give everybody that's watching one more chance to type in a question. And I, I wanted to know if you could go back to your um, hexagonal hub slide, because this is how crazy this whole Corona situation has made me. Um, I immediately saw two rolls of toilet paper with the user and the to-do list. I mean, that's... <laughs> Um, but I love I loved all your your drawings and the way that you uh, underlined things as you went. So I don't see any more questions coming in. So I would just like to give you a big heartfelt thanks uh, from Vjug and also uh, a thank you for uh, rescheduling with us. Thanks to everybody that watched and for um, tuning in a second time. I do appreciate it. Technical issues happen and everybody was really, really nice to me. So it made me feel good. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and end the stream and say thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Alberto, for your great session. And uh, stay tuned for more great uh, sessions from Vija coming up. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Laurie. Really, very nice. Happy.